I'm here with Jonathan Ryan, who is the executive director of RAICES, which is an organization that was formed to help refugees in, in South Texas and who has been providing legal assistance to refugees who are many of these women and children who have been coming from Central America. Um, Jonathan, what's going on here today and how did this come about? We have, for a little over a year now, been running a shelter here in San Antonio that receives the women and children who are released from the Carnes and the Dilly family detention centers that are managed by Immigration Customs Enforcement. They're for-profit facilities run by companies, but then managed by immigration. In the private, last couple of days, prisons. that's right, in the last three days, mm -hmm. following a federal court decision that struck against the state of Texas and uh, told the state of Texas that it could not change its rules to permit these for-profit prisons to apply for child care licenses. Ever since Saturday morning, we have seen ICE releasing large numbers of women and children. They've released them to our uh, shelter, which ran out of space. We were very, very graciously hosted here where we stand at the Mennonite Church in San Antonio. The Mennonite community has been part of our work at RAICES since our founding and before. And in many respects, this is a full circle experience. As So what the judge on uh, Friday said was that despite their attempts to apply to, to, uh, to gain licenses as if they were child care facilities, the state of Texas is unable to change its own state rules solely so that these these prisons can can get those licenses. Well, what the what the state of Texas was trying to do was also license them as child care facilities, but have some enormous exceptions, which would have these children um, be in the same place as adults who were unrelated, and and also as other children who were not related to them, which um, normal Texas child care um, licensors would prevent. There's a laundry list of requirements that the federal government requires of any, any uh, custodial setting for a child. Mm -hmm. And there's also a laundry list of, uh, uh, of violations uh, of acts that have been performed by these companies. We expect that people will continue to be released. Uh, over this weekend, we had more than 500 people released and we slept, uh, we provided housing, food, medicine, we had doctors here on site, transportation to the airport for all of these people. And based on our observations over the past two years, we also know that our, our Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, Agency is incapable, is incompetent, and ill-equipped to house mothers and children. It's not what they do, they shouldn't try. And so most of, if not a vast majority, of the women and children who arrive here do have family contacts, someone with whom they can live. They are not dependent on our government to provide any housing. We received over 200 women and very younger, ten, young, tender age children last night in the rain, in the cold, in the streets, in a strange location. If our immigration authorities claim that they exist to protect our communities. How can they explain putting women and children in such danger, having volunteers waiting until three o'clock in the morning in the streets in the rain? That is in no way protective of anyone's security. But what we, what we know is that the time that they spend here is a time when they receive support, when they do not have to worry about their own safety or that of their children. And, and that's a great blessing for us. We accept fresh fruit. We accept food that is ready to eat, um, hot pizza, for example. We do not normally accept canned goods or dried food. We prefer that individuals donate money. One thing that we really pride ourselves on is that the food that we provide here is, is fresh. It is, it is local. It is Central American cooking. It is, in many cases, the first time that many of these families, many of these children, will have tasted a meal that is in any way familiar or comfortable to them. And so we prefer that individuals who are able to donate money do so, and the food items that we do accept directly are fresh fruit. The food in the for-profit immigration detention centers is not just unfamiliar to these people. It is disgusting. It is rancid. It is inedible. I am here with Jenny Hickson. And Jenny, tell me what your role is. Um, so I am a member of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, and I also work for RAICES as the Community Outreach Coordinator, which means I oversee CASA. And by CASA, you mean the 
the house that is near the Mennonite church where we're, we're standing, and, and that is a house that has received many of the women and children, refugees, asylum-seeking moms and kids um, over the past couple of years, right? It's right near here. And we have seen a 350% increase in the number of people that we're seeing at CASA since January. And that's before this past weekend, right? That is before this past weekend, yes. Okay. Okay. And we have received as many people this past weekend as we received in the first four months of this year. And, and, a, and a reminder, I mean, they are fleeing horrific violence, the murder capital of the world, um, and in, in extraordinary poverty and um, in uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. made an enormous journey to get here. Yes, they have made enormous journeys knowing that the whole way was going to be mi pretty miserable for them. And so I think it speaks to both the character of the people who come here and um, the things that they are fleeing that they choose to make that journey um, and that they are um, here with us. And they are lovely, lovely people because this would not work if they were not. We have moms who are sweeping, we have moms who are cleaning, we have moms who watch each other's kids. If people were not cooperative, this whole system would fall right apart. So I think this is an, a situation where you see so many people together acting in cooperation in a way um, that I don't think we always appreciate. Yes, they were brought here by Carnes and Dilly, although the majority of these people were from Dilly. Um, and they were brought here by ICE as part of our normal protocol. However, they brought us, you know, in almost 10 times more than they normally bring us. The first email was late Friday night, um, and we were getting emails all day Saturday. Um, and we were continuing to receive people until 2.30 in the morning on Saturday. We received 55 people at 2.30 in the morning on Saturday. The other thing that has been strange about this particular weekend um, is that normally the people who come to us have most of their travel arrangements made. So, you know, our average stay at CASA is a day and a half. And so that means that most people come and they stay one night because they already have their bus or their plane tickets arranged. Last night of the 200 and something people that we had here, only 10 people had their travel arrangements finalized, which means that the vast majority of these people, um, we are having to get them in contact with their family. We're having to do basically the job that ICE is being paid to do um, as part of their case management program here, because ICE is not doing the part of their job that they're supposed to do, which is making sure that people have travel arrangements completed before they release them. The majority of people that um, come through CASA are connecting with a family member. Some are connecting with, you know, friends, but most people are going to family elsewhere in the United States. We've had a bunch of uh, community members, some from the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, who have generously donated prepaid phones, and so that's helped us out a lot. But um, it's and those phones are so that people can call their family members. Exactly, exactly, and they and need, they need quite a bit of assistance with that. Most of their families don't know how to buy tickets. I think, I think what we need from the community right now, to be quite honest, is that we need money so that we can buy the things that we know we need. Last night we spent $1,700 on buying um, beds and sheets and all the things that we need um, to get here. Um, we're taking people to the hospital, we're going to have to pay for those bills, all of those sorts of things. People have been very generous with food, we have lots of clothing now, um, but we need the funds to support this. We do need volunteers, specifically Spanish-speaking volunteers, we need two types of volunteers. Volunteers who are willing to clean, because as you can imagine, having this many people in this space, this many children in a space, um, we need lots of people to help us keep the space clean for everyone. Um, and we need volunteers who speak Spanish, who can help troubleshoot those travel arrangements, who can do all of the sort of assistance that we need to make sure that people, um, that people need, and they need to be able to speak Spanish fluently to do that. Uh, we do need prepaid phones, prepaid phones that have, um, so we've had some people donate them that had unlimited minutes for one month. Um, those are perfect and wonderful and that allows us to, to do a lot and make sure that our families get to connect with each other. Um, we need toiletries, we need some of those items for sure. I think some of the things that we need are things to entertain the kids here. So if people had crayons, if people had coloring books, no toys with batteries or that make noise. <laughs> <laughs> because on mass, that's pretty rough to deal with. But if they have things that can keep the kids occupied that, again, aren't, are unfortunately wouldn't be able to use paint, please no glitter. Um, but those sorts of things would be really, really useful. The kids are here, and, you know, frankly, they're bored. This is not a space that's meant to be um, used by this many children. Okay. I'm here, I'm here with John Garland, who is the pastor of the Mennonite Church. Mm -hmm. And um, John... Uh, you have given over your entire church to 400, 500 people last night? Yeah. Um, tell me how you feel about that. Well, 
I mean, we're Mennonites, and you know, Mennonites are, are you know one of the one of the Anabaptist groups. When we're like uh, uh, any other Christian, we believe that this is not our church; it's God's church, um, and the church is is the family of God, and the church is the is the body of Christ in this world, and the buildings are a gift, um, and it's it's nothing that uh, more than that; it's a gift. Um, and when God gives us gifts, we have to use them. Um, and 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 Jesus told parables about this and he also gave direct teachings about this if you're given a gift you, you have to use it um, so I would say we're grateful first um, and we also feel honored um, as a church that we get to um, um, be a part of it and be the vessel um, and as the pastor um, saying yes you can y- use our building is one obvious of course and two um, is just an enormous privilege you know that someone would be like hey Here's this amazing gift. Um, can we use it? And of course, the answer is um, yes. They went, and we're privileged to say yes. We want to help these people. And reminded also when Jesus says, "When you serve these folks, the least of these, um, when you serve these people who are thirsty and they're hungry, you're also serving me." <clears throat> so as we're preparing for Advent, yeah, it's a, it's a great privilege. This little guy who you're holding, um, his mom got here, arrived here, so sick that she was immediately hospitalized, and he's been. He has been held and and loved and is being carried around by you and is being taken care of. Yeah, I mean, he's a, just a precious child, and and and, and there at no point uh, since he's been here um, has he has he not been held or taken care of by someone. Um, and that's one of those things where where you're like, well, only by only by the grace of God, because we're we're in a room full of people who have nothing next to nothing um and have nothing to give except their own love and they will they say to this child like you will not be abandoned right you will not also haven't slept very much so get a little emotional right because the busloads just kind of come and come and come and they also um come at the worst hours like really so it's so uh yeah it's easy to get a little emotional but yeah this precious child i mean uh, the the um the, the the people here say you know we're gonna hold you um, we're gonna take care of you even though we don't really have anything else to give um except that that assurance um and that and that presence yeah so the good news though is that we found her, the, his father and contacted him and and uh, he's planning to get here as soon as he can um and his mother is recovering in the hospital Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm.